good morning. Uh, I will I will speak in English if that's okay. So, uh, well, apparently I'm sharing the table with two economists. And, of course, I immediately, you know, looking at my great like myself with the economists on the table, I immediately thought of the story about uh, a banker. I am a banker, a real banker, not a pretend banker. Um, and, uh, and also the story about an Irishman in South America. Or at least we like to think of him as an Irishman. He was uh, born here in, in Buenos Aires, and his, his great claim to fame is that uh, he was from a middle class family, you know, stock, uh, true blue, blue uh, middle class family. And he decided to go on a road trip on a motorbike. And off he went on the motorbike. And his name was Ernie Lynch. And um, by the time his road trip ended, he was called Che Guevara, and he was now in Cuba. And he was in Cuba with a fellow called Fidel Castro. And so they were having this meeting, you know, they, they got their country finally, and you know, they were trying to set it all up. And they were trying to, you know, get, get on with the boring, uh, boring parts of life instead of the revolution. So they're putting together, you know, things like the central bank and so on, so they're meeting <coughs> Castro says, you know, I need somebody to run the central bank, so he can the economists get out here. And Che Guevara puts up his hand to me. So he was made president of the central bank. And he, he was, by the way, the tallest story, he was president of the central bank. And after a couple of years, well, lo and behold, the central bank was bankrupt. So Che Guevara calls him in and says, Hey, Che, I mean, how do you bankrupt the central bank? Can't, I mean, I. I asked in the room, were there any economists? And she says, economists? Oh, I heard communists. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, now that we've all had a bit of giggle, and I've had a minor lateral swipe at my two economist friends at the table, um, I'm going to try to keep my remarks short. I'll go fast. Uh, if you get bored, stop me. Um, I'm going to dissect the title of today looking at economic intelligence, connected world, digital economy, how does it work, what can we expect, and perhaps some thoughts about going forward. <coughs> Before starting, I, I, I want to make it clear where I come from. I am a banker, a, a real banker. Um, so that means that I'm not an economist. I am, if I'm going to be given a label, I'm a sociologist. Because a banker needs to understand what makes people behave in a certain way. What will make him give me back the money if I give him the money? What will make him pay me more than I gave him? We call it interest. Uh, but if I give you 100, I want back 100. 50, we just discuss over how long it will be, and in as, as as we call it in this part of the world. So a banker needs to understand people, and what makes people tick, and what pisses them off. Okay, so I look at the title, um, it's, it's actually quite different in Spanish and in English. Smart Economies for a Connected World, the Digital Economy. Okay. My mother tongue's in English, so it goes fine. I look at uh, the Spanish title, Economía Inteligente, para un mundo conectado, la economía digital. And my first question is, hmm, economic intelligence, smart economy. Let's, let's have a look and see what does that mean. Now, I would immediately, I'm, I'm going to build this conversation in building blocks. So there's logic to this as we go along. Firstly, uh, there's a very big difference between people and corporations, between physical persons and juridical persons. People are people. Companies are cold. People are hot. Um, classic economic theory describes consumers as rational economic actors. 
let's select an, al an alternative only after considering the relevant information. My experience is that this is very far from the truth. This logical process is a key factor in some purchases, let's say, you know, some decisions, elections, selections by individuals, but normally not. Perhaps in only about 5% of cases. Um, this kind of logical approach is actually quite detrimental to retail activity. There's an interesting study that shows online that the more information you load up on the page about the product, the less people buy it. They want a pretty picture, they want the very basic information, they don't want to know where it's been made, they don't want to know, know the content of the library, and, and so on. The more you load up on the page, the less they will buy it. In fact, there is the infamous impulse purchase, and the impulse purchase goes on many things. Men used to buy cars if they had a go faster stripe in the 80s. Now, don't tell me that that is logical uh, as, a, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a basis for taking the decision. So the concept of gut feeling, instinct, the automatic reaction, which is somehow subconscious, is critical when we are considering the digital economy. Now, um, economic intelligence has another, or smart economics, if you like, has another twist to it. And that is, you are trying to know and understand an outside environment to prevent risks, particularly in relation to physical material um, and to consider ethical influence. That's a big mouthful of words. What do I mean by that? I mean knowledge management. The management of knowledge and human resources. Because people have explicit <coughs> and implicit knowledge that will be revealed only if they have reliable processes and real motivation in their organization. Organizations take purchasing decisions. They take implementation decisions. My point being that they tend to be a little bit more rational um, than the individual at 11 o'clock at night sitting at home in front of a computer surfing eBay or Amazon or, or some other research. For states, for multinationals, for multilaterals, and for supranationals alike, economic intelligence is a tool for competition. It's a tool for governance, and it's a tool for national security. The purpose of combining economic intelligence with knowledge management is to transform information into knowledge and to tra transform that knowledge into value-added, preferably value-added, which can be sustained. So, with, in the generic uh, title of our program, I say that we need to consider people very differently from considering corporations. They are very different beasts. Now let's look at the connected world. How big is the marketplace for, uh, for information and communication? technologies, goods and services. A couple of hard numbers. Um, the goods big piece of it is about 1.6 trillion dollars or euros. Pretty much the same these days. 
it's grown at around 6% per annum um, for the last 10 or so years. Uh, if you want the precise numbers, I can give you another precise number. And I'd like to note that during this period, the share of exports attributable to the United States and Japan has fallen by 50%, for goods. Mexico is about 19% of the market. China, including Taipei, um, is about 41% of the market. Started at 10. And the rest of the world is 40 so you've got China, Mexico, and other. That's for goods. For services, the market is much smaller. It's 0.4 trillion. So combined, they make about 2, two trillion. But it's growing at 30% a year. Now, within the, this services category, telecom services is flat as a pancake. And what is growing is computer services and information services. Double. Are you sitting down? Ireland and India, about neck to neck, account for shy of 30% of the global market. Well done, Ireland. China, Germany, the United States, and the United Kingdom combined are another 30%. And the rest is the rest of the world. I thought those numbers were interesting to lay out because at the end of the day, I'm a banker, so I believe in trade and how are we going to make some money. Um, otherwise, you know, we'll all have a nice cup of tea or an Irish whiskey and we can have a philosophical chat. So, with that kind of market in place, <coughs> I've come back to the concept of connectivity. And <coughs> I don't want to be a party pooper, but I look at connectivity across the board and I see a pretty lamentable picture. We have an awful lot of work to do. I look at air, I don't see open sky policies. I look at the sea. Well, we have standard containers, that's a good start. We still have piracy on Santos in Brazil, uh, Somalia, but by and large, containers are okay, they're doing well. Roads, doing well in Europe, completely underdeveloped <coughs> in South America. Um, the US, last time they really went road building was, was uh, when they poured a lot of concrete um, a long, long time ago their interstate highway uh, program, and they haven't really invested any money since then. Railways, seriously underdeveloped in this part of the world. In Europe, they're starting to bring them back for passengers in cities. Either they're reintroducing what used to be there. In Ireland, we had to go and buy up the line again, buy it back, put the rails back down again, and put the trains back in again. But rail is a very cheap way of moving goods and materials and we have a lamentable network in this country. Uh, the river, uh, I live in Paraguay. I've lived there for 12 years. Um, I have great fun there, it's a wonderful place to be. Um, we don't have the fancy problems of Brazil or in Argentina, um, except that there are neighbors now registrating partners, so every time you get a cold, we catch the flu, and we take many bad values and move on. But the river is uh, critical. Uh, Paraguay has the third largest fleet of river barges in the world after the United States and China. Um, we are located and surrounded by a river complex, the equivalent of the Mississippi in the United States um, in South America, which ultimately ends up as what is between you and uh, uh, Europe and the water that comes down. Electricity. I look at the interconnection of electricity, and it's lamentable. I mean, talk about defending the legacy. Um, I look at broadband. It's not too bad. Paraguay just got its second broadband connection in the world, 
And we have one with Argentina and one with Brazil. So we have two. 100% um, more than we had last year. So that's good. It'd be nice to have a little bit more redundancy than that. Um, but do we have fiber optic between our cities? No. Uh, the state of our broadband connection is lamentable. And the quality of your broadband connections is the quality of the speed of delivery of the information and the choice of the consumer and the order of the company and, and, and all the preparation that goes into the set. Telephones. We are still with interconnecting charges. Europe. Have you eliminated them yet in Europe? All, all, almost. almost. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, 21st century, and we're starting to, 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 to confront that when I drive from south of County Loud to just north of County Loud, that I don't have to pay an international roaming charge. Um, you know, why do we have roaming charges between Encarnacion and Posadas? <laughs> Why do we have an international roaming charge between the Falls and Suida de Leste? Um, so we don't, we don't score very high on that level either. Um, trade barriers. Well, I've listed out a whole lot of physical bottlenecks. Then on top of that, we need to put regulatory barriers. Product standards, number one. Do you know that no cheese consumed in Ireland is fit for human consumption from Paraguay unless it goes through our laboratory? Don't know what you do over there in Ireland. You could all be dying of cheese poisoning. It has to go through my laboratory. And it's the same in Argentina. And it's the same in Brazil. And this is a much more powerful trade barrier tool than many of the others. Economic barriers, taxation, okay. but tariffs and subsidies. I have to pay $520 per ton for the privilege of selling my sugar, my organic demerara sugar in Europe. And I get $650 a ton. The tax imposed by Europe on one of the only two remaining LDC countries in South America is almost 100%. We have a very rude saying in the chapel, in the semi arid desert in Paraguay, which is never believe your own bullshit. The point I'm making is that we have tremendous barriers. And we have this business, this game changer, which is based on connectivity. And the state of our connectivity is lamentable. And this means that the commerce that we can develop with the digital economy is highly limited because we are not a global world. We are only at the beginning of being a global world. And if I can't move my stuff, then I can be globally but only locally. Airbnb. The product is produced locally and the product is consumed locally. The computer can be anywhere. Uh, Uber. The car is in Buenos Aires. The customer is in Buenos Aires. The payment is in Buenos Aires. This is not a global business. This is a globally local business. We will not be able to get true globalization without having the destruction of barriers. And here the role of government is critical. So I want to give one very exciting example, which is not the usual example that people give for the digital economy. And the example I want to give is a company called Alcoa. Alcoa, aluminium, making stuff out of aluminium. Because when we talk about digital economy, we like to talk about ticks versus bricks, and everything's virtual, and everything physical is bad. And in fact, the most money to be made 
is of for physical goods and physical services. Alcoa is benefiting tremendously. They want to make a piece for a test piece for an engine. With digital printing, they can now make that piece in two weeks. And it used to take 18 months. That means that I can have three different tests over in much less of the time than it used to take to get the delivery of one piece to test if I'm Boeing or if I'm Airbus. The most exciting thing in, in, in the digital revolution that, that we are beginning is that just as in the first industrial revolution, some would say the second, the transformation of I used to hand make the cloth and then I machine made it. And I, I believe that where we're going now is we're going to go back to bespoken cloth made by machines to order by the customer. And this will be the great revolution that we will see. Along this path, I promise I'm going to be short. Along this path, I want to say that the role of government is critical. And the role of regulation is critical. And I would make an appeal <coughs> to anybody who is listening. Do not fall into the trap that we were all led into by the smart, well-washed bankers of London and New York. Self-regulation does not work. The first mover advantage in the connected world of the internet was money laundering, prostitution, pornography, gambling. These are the industries that profited first from the internet. And then we caught up, because we didn't like the idea of pornography, prostitution, gambling, uh, uh, outside of uh, any regulation, and so on and so forth. And we go on to the next phase, and we start to get some interesting businesses. We don't mention Ryanair, but Ryanair's business model is based on the consumer being able to buy directly from Ryanair. I don't want any travel agents. Uh, you, you don't have the experience yet here of an ultra low cost carrier. Um, I think you will have uh, sometime in the next five, five or ten years. Um, but it's really, truly a joy to be able to travel around Europe for 20, 30 euros. Ryanair was one of the first people to build its business model on this connectivity thing. Um, Uber is a recent arrival. Um, but regulation is key. And just because you can, doesn't mean you should. And, and I'm going to leave you with a story of a man called Rudy Vonnie, a banker I met many years ago, for whom I have great respect. And he was on the board of Swiss Bank Corporation. And we bought a company called the O'Connor Partnership in Chicago. And they were one of the early one of the very first companies involved in a mysterious thing called derivatives. Uh, and, and, and sometimes, listening to the talk about the digital economy, I, I, I can't help but hear an echo of the discussion of derivatives. And so, to cut a long story short, um, one day at the board, this 27-year-old comes in and he explains um, what they're doing with the $500 billion book of derivatives. And all the directors of the Swiss Bank Corporation are sitting around going, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and uh, out the kid goes out of the room, and Rudy Bonnie puts up his hand. And he says, excuse me, I have no idea what this kid is talking about. But one thing is for sure. We're not Ronald Bank. He is. So I'd like a sabbatical. I want to go to the London School of Economics. I want to take a degree in advanced mathematics. And I'll be back. <laughs> and they all applauded him. They looked nervously at the ground because they did not intend to go to the London School of Economics. So the bank continued with no management for a year. And no direction from the board because they didn't understand what they were in charge of. And then Rudy came back, um, and, uh, and, and, and life continued. 
And it's important that our <coughs> governance institutions take this as an indicator of how to behave. Just because it's new doesn't mean we have to throw out everything that we have. Ethical standards need to be maintained in interaction between people and companies. And I am dead against the let's have no regulation. For example, in my sector, let's have crowdfunding. Oh, really? You want to advertise on the internet a credit product when in my world, unless you can demonstrate that you've got $5 million, I'm not allowed to sell you the product. So why on earth should we be selling it to people who don't know what they're doing on the internet? And there we go.